the Palestinian uh, and the alternatives of negotiations. And I think this is very important topic and uh, we are very privileged to have key speakers in this session that we will address key questions in my perspective that we all aspire to get answers uh, for. In this, in this session, I expect that the audience and generally the people, they'd like to see what are the alternatives of negotiations. Where are we heading from here? What do we expect uh, to, what, what do we anticipate to do? And now we don't have, we have dictation, we have dictation of uh, policies by Trump, by Netanyahu, and it's very clear. What are we doing in front of this? How are we heading? What are the prospects? So the, the speakers, uh, hopefully they will answer all these questions in this session. And I would like uh, to, uh, based on the request, we have some change of the structure of this session. Uh, based on the request of Dr. Saab, he prefers to be the last one to speak in respect of international speakers. So please welcome with me um, uh, Mr. Batchin, who is a member of the Legislative Assembly since 2010. Currently, he is the uh, spokesperson of the uh, Sinn Féin on the Health and International Affairs, a former member of the Irish Republican Army and he himself spent over 18 years in prison for his armed resistance to British occupation. He endured 55 days on hunger strike in 81 uh, when Bobby Stans and nine other Irish Republican martyrs lost their lives in the H block struggle for the political status. He is a member of the Shen Fen negotiating team, which has been endeavoring to re-establish the political institutions and the implementation of previous agreements in the Northern Ireland. I mean, it's um, the Northern Ireland um, issue is uh, very complicated and it's very important that we learn from this special experience of a person who himself suffered and went and uh, uh, went through suffering and through imprisoning and the floor is yours to listen to you and to your special experience and to present the Northern Ireland issue. Thank you very much. I, I want to first of all apologize to the translators. I didn't provide a copy of what I'm going to say. Um, that's because I haven't got a copy myself. Um, but I, I've been told for an Irish person I speak quite slowly. Uh, there, there are people in Ireland who speak so quickly that even I can't understand them. So you're, you're, you're lucky to have me in that respect. Um, uh, but before I get into what I am going to say, uh, I just want to tell a short story. It relates to the Israelis, you know, and how clever they are and how smart they are and how omnipotent they are. And uh, just back in April there, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, who was mentioned previously by Lely and her contribution, uh, the... Dublin uh, City Council passed a motion calling for the expulsion of the Israeli ambassador from Ireland and also called for support for the BDS campaign. And uh, Michal McDonagha, who is the mayor, was invited by the PA to a conference. I think it was here in Ramallah. It may have been in Jerusalem, but it was on the status of Jerusalem uh, in any event. And the, the title of the Lord Mayor of Dublin is Ard Vera. And uh, the Israelis, uh, when they heard Michal was traveling uh, to Palestine, 
said that they weren't going to allow him through Ben-Gurion, that he would be stopped and sent home. However, lo and behold, uh, the next thing we heard was that Michal was tweeting from Ramallah that he had arrived safe and sound. And as it turned out, the Israeli security had been searching for someone called Ardvera, which is the Irish for Lord Mayor. So uh, the, uh, the, the competence of the Israelis uh, in that respect was mind-boggling. So in any event, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to come here today and address this conference. And I bring warm uh, fraternal solidarity greetings from our party, Sinn Féin. And by the way, the Ardvera Michal McDonough is also a member of our party. And I also want to bring greetings from many, many people in Ireland who support the cause of Palestinian independence and statehood. The Irish people are almost unique in Europe in having suffered for the, from exploitation and discrimination as a result of British colonization of Ireland. Uh, therefore, we have a strong love and empathy for the Palestinian people because we understand what their struggle is all about. And it's particularly poignant to be here, uh, to be here in Palestine on this, the 70th anniversary of the Nakba, when, uh, when thousands, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were driven from their land and from their homes. And of course, the Nakba didn't end in 1948. Uh, it's a living nightmare for the Palestinian up to the present day of death, imprisonment, torture, oppression and repression. And I suppose the reason we're all gathered here today is to uh, attempt to navigate through all the difficulties that exist uh, by providing uh, our own experiences and by sharing our own experiences in, in, in our own fields of expertise. And I'm here today to share the experience of Sinn Féin in building what is considered by many people to have been a successful peace process in Ireland. And I, I don't want to suggest for a second that the, the Good Friday Agreement, which was the outworking of the peace process in 1998, I don't want to suggest that that agreement is a template for a resolution of the political conflict here in this region. Uh, nevertheless, there may be aspects of it uh, that could be useful. And I want to begin by uh, setting a brief historical uh, context of the conflict in Ireland. And I'll try to be brief on that and explain uh, the origins of the, of the modern peace process in Ireland. And Ireland was colonised over 800 years ago by the British. And from the 16th century on, there was rebellion in almost every generation. Uh, the occupation of Ireland was contested uh, by a variety of actions. There was armed rebellion, there were land protests, boycotts, and of course the word boycott comes from Ireland. There were non-violent civil rights campaigns and prison protests, including hunger strikes. And one of the key periods of Irish history was between 1916 and 1921. Uh, when there was armed uprising against the, the British occupation of Ireland. And that resulted uh, in 1921 in the partition of Ireland. There are 32 counties in Ireland. Uh, 26 of those uh, counties gained a measure of independence and the other six remained under British jurisdiction and remained part of the UK. And it remains that way to the present day. And the, when that state, that six county state was created, there was an artificial majority also created in that. So that those who favored retaining the link with Britain, the unionists, would have an inbuilt and almost perpetual majority. And famously or notoriously, the first Prime Minister of the new institutions described it as 
a Protestant parliament, and the Unionists were by and large from the Protestant faith, I described it as a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. And the upshot of that was that if you weren't a Protestant or a Unionist, you became a second-class citizen within the new six-county state, which is called Northern Ireland. Uh, and so there was institutionalized sectarianism and discrimination in employment, in housing, in education, in every walk of life. Uh, Irish people in their own country were second-class citizens. Um, the, in the 1960s, uh, a civil rights campaign uh, commenced, and it was based on the civil rights campaign that was ongoing in the United States at that time, led by Dr. Martin Luther King. And it was, uh, as I say, a non-violent form of protest. Uh, the people protesting were simply asking for reform of the northern state to end the discrimination and the sectarianism and give people a shot at equality within the state. Um, that protest was met violently by the state. Protesters were beaten off the streets uh, and uh, it led to an increase in tension, an increase in violence on the street and fears among the unionist community which were uh, fueled by their political leaders that the IRA uh, was just waiting to attack them and to overthrow the state. The IRA, in effect, didn't exist in the late 1960s. And uh, the IRA came back into being, initially to protect the communities from attack. But then when the British Army arrived on the street, and at one time there were over 30,000 British troops stationed on the streets in the north of Ireland, uh, they came into confrontation. And they were, they were there solely, the British will tell you, they were there to keep the two communities apart. Uh, our analysis is that they were there to support and shore up a political regime that was in crisis. Uh, and very soon they came into conflict with the IRA and the war developed from that. And uh, I suppose... Uh, I, I always say it's, it's quite easy to start a war. Uh, and that war in, in the north of Ireland sort of gathered momentum out of the political conditions that existed at that time. Uh, you know, when, when you look back, you might say it was almost inevitable, given that it was taking place in a, in a context of 800 years of colonialism and uh, treating uh, citizens... Uh, as second-class citizens within their, their own country. But a, another example of starting a war is, I mean, fly a couple of planes into the Twin Towers, uh, and what was the result of that? You know, a war, you know, right across the globe, uh, American intervention uh, in, 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 in parts of the world, and, I mean, uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people uh, dead and injured uh, since that. So I'm just making the point, it's quite easy to start a war. It's much more difficult to end one. Uh, and, and, and let me just be clear here, because uh, I'm speaking in the context of, of Palestine and sitting here talking about Palestine, and I have been challenged previously by, Pal by Palestinians about talking, uh, you know, using the term war and conflict as if there was some sort of equality of arms between the two forces. And, you know, I know that's not the case. Our, our, our analysis about Palestine uh, takes place through a prism of colonialism. So we, we understand uh, the conditions and the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the situation here in, in regards to the Israeli colonization of Palestinian land and the oppression of the, of the Palestinian people. So um, to start uh, or to end a war, we believed in Ireland that we needed a strategy. In fact, uh, our leader, 
Our former leader now, Jerry Adams, uh, Jerry stood down last November and has been replaced by Mary Lou MacDonald, uh, a female leader. But Jerry was famous within our movement for, for telling us in regard to all issues, the three most important things we have to do are strategize, strategize, and strategize. Uh, that's what we need to do. So we, we needed to develop a strategy that didn't compromise on our ultimate objective. We, we in Sinn Féin want a united, independent Ireland, free from any British uh, interference. And although the armed conflict has end, ended, that is still our ultimate objective. Uh, and we needed to develop a strategy that didn't compromise on that ultimate objective of having a united, independent uh, republic free from any British uh, interference. And within that strategy, we needed to have strate strategic objectives that governed all our actions. Everything we did had to relate back to the strategic objectives. Uh, and, and I'll give you some examples of those but let me also say that Irish Republicans have a similar history uh, to Palestinians in terms of splits uh, and divisions and even internecine warfare uh, at times. So one of our most important strategic objectives was to ensure that there was internal unity and cohesion within our movement. Um, because... Um, if we had moved into a new dispensation, into a peace process, and it's very difficult to convince many people whose whole lives have been geared towards armed conflict that there may well be an alternative. Uh, and we had, to, we had to convince those people uh, within our movement that there was an alternative to armed struggle because if our movement had split on the day we decided we were moving into a peace process, there wouldn't have been a pro peace process. The peace process would have ended on the first day that our movement split. So, and to that end, uh, one of the most important negotiations uh, is with our own movement. Uh, because if we couldn't convince them that, uh, that if we couldn't convince them to support a peace process, it wouldn't even get off the ground. And we also recognised the need to keep our base constantly informed about potential developments, uh, especially those which were most contentious. Uh, and some of the big contentious issues uh, in our peace process was, for example, the issue of weapons. Uh, the British and the Unionists wanted the IRA to surrender its weapons. As far as the IRA was concerned, it had been undefeated on the battlefield, so why, why would they surrender anything? Uh, similarly, uh, issues around policing and justice. Uh, you know, the, the, policing, the police had been a military wing of the, the, the North of Ireland government. It had been used to uh, repress uh, Irish nationalists and Republicans. They were involved in torture. They were involved in extrajudicial killings and so on. But we needed, every society needs a police service. There needed to be reform of the police service. Uh, and our own people, uh, you know, were very emotional about the, the thought of people who had been involved in the police still being involved in the police after a peace process. So though those were difficult issues, and there was no point trying to surprise uh, our supporters or our rank and file members about those issues. There needed to be constant uh, and ongoing dialogue. And even to the present day, uh, one of the things that our party always does is keep in contact with our base. Uh, we have meetings all over the country on various issues, uh, and, and we like 
to get feedback all the time. And, and going back to Jerry Adams, uh, Jerry always says at practically every meeting, and I'm fed up listening to him say this, the answers to all the questions are in this room. And the answers to the Palestinian issue are in this room. People, people know what they are, and, and people in this room and other meetings uh, throughout the length and breadth of Palestine and in the diaspora and so on will provide the answers of what's needed uh, to advance uh, the Palestinian struggle. And another example of our strategic objectives was the need to build national and international alliances. Um, some of those alliances may have been short term and focused maybe on one issue. Others were, were longer term uh, and focused on a greater complexity of, of, of issues. You know, but we have long recognized that we, we couldn't win our struggle on our own. We needed to marshal all the resources that we possibly could. So for example, over 40 million people in the United States uh, claim to be of Irish descent. Uh, and the Irish American lobby in the States is, is very powerful. In fact, it's probably the second most powerful uh, after the Jewish lobby in the States. And uh, when we were developing our strategy to move into a peace process, and, and, and other political parties will say that they came and they took us by the hand and brought us into you know, the peace process. Uh, they led us along the way. You know, that completely contradicts the facts that we threw out a challenge to other parties and uh, you know, political opponents in some cases if you're telling us that armed struggle is wrong, if you're saying that it's a hindrance towards reaching our ultimate objectives, then you have to become involved with us in developing an alternative peaceful strategy. Uh, so we had to build alliance, alliances with people who were our political opponents. We didn't agree with everything on them, but we may have agreed with, with one or two issues. And, and that was important to provide momentum to the peace process and to create a, a unity of purpose uh, about where we were going. We, we also felt it was important that there was a clear message that people can, can understand and that, that there can be no ambiguity around and that your political opponents can't misrepresent. And one of the clearest examples I give of that is the, at the time of the 1981 hunger strike, and there was a prison protest for five years leading up to the, the, the hunger strike, and our basic demand was that we be treated as political prisoners. And, you know, it seems quite straightforward, I'm sure to most people here, what we were asking for. But of course, our political opponents tried to misrepresent that. They said, we wanted to take over the prisons. We wanted to do this, that, and, and the other. Uh, if, you, if you support this, you support the IRA, you support the armed campaign. And you know, even back at that time, we understood that we needed to bring a broad spectrum, as broad a spectrum of support as possible to support our uh, campaign within the prisons. So, we developed um, five simple demands that were quite clear and unambiguous. Uh, you know, the right to wear our own clothes in prison, the right not to have to do degrading prison work, the right to a visit, you know, a week, the right to a parcel a week, and the right to associate with our own comrades. So, you know, people, who had difficulty um, with the armed struggle, but who were sympathetic to the plight of the prisoners, could then give their support to that. And one of my difficulties, even in Ireland, where there is you know, great support for the Palestinian people and, and the Palestinian cause, um, 
we still end up in, in, in conflict with each other about whether we support a one state or a two state, whether we should be supporting uh, Fatah and the PLO or whether we should be supporting Hamas or, you know, and, uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be, and I'm not being critical uh, of the Palestinian leadership, I'm just stating the fact that th there, there doesn't appear to be that clear direction uh, of, of, from the leadership about what are the demands, what's the clear demand, what's the unambiguous uh, request or demand of the, of the Palestinian people that people can then give their support to. Uh, and, and, and that's, I think, that, that's important. Uh, you know, there, I suppose the talk here today is about um, creative alternatives to negotiation. You know, in a political conflict, there's no alternative to negotiation. The only way to resolve a political, well, there are two ways to resolve a, a conflict. One is for one side to completely obliterate the other and wipe them out, which in my view is the mindset of the Israelis at the minute. Or there's a negotiated settlement which involves compromise uh, on all sides. And, you know, in this day and age, there isn't a clear-cut end to most political conflicts. There needs to be some sort of negotiated settlement which involves compromise on all sides. Having said that, I mean, negotiation is at, is at the end of the continuum. The tactics that are used to get you to the negotiating table are, are what's important. These aren't alternatives to negotiation, but they're important. And Lely mentioned the, the BDS campaign. Uh, earlier today, we talked about taking legal action uh, in the international courts uh, against Israel. There is, of course, mass mobilization uh, and, and whatever, whatever other tactics uh, exist that you know, revolutionary movements and organization all over this planet, you know, since history began, uh, have used uh, to advance their struggle. And uh, I suppose the, what, what needs to happen, I think, uh, is that struggle can be opened, can be opened up on many fronts. Uh, in, in, in our particular case in Ireland, we didn't contest elections until 1981. The first Republican to contest elections in the modern era was Bobby Sands when he was in hunger strike in prison in 1981. And we had a debate within our movement uh, about whether he should stand. There were, there were reasons why we didn't contest elections. One, because in the regime that had been established in the north of Ireland. Uh, nationalists and Republicans who participated in that, and not all did, uh, they only ever succeeded in having one piece of legislation enacted. And that was to do with the protection of wild birds. Nothing about improving the condition of the people who they represented or bringing about uh, equality. So, uh, Others thought by engaging in an electoral process, uh, you would have to <coughs> compromise your core principles in, in some way. But we had a debate about whether Bobby should stand in that election. And in the end, up those who were advocating it won the day. And Margaret Thatcher, the British Prime Minister, had said, the IRA has no support. The prisoners have no support. And Bobby Sands was elected as a member of the British Parliament, and that completely blew Margaret Thatcher's argument out of the water. And that convinced many Republicans who had been skeptical that there were benefits to be had from engaging in the electoral process. And that opened up as another site of struggle for us. Uh, and I was discussing this with, with one of our senior people Excuse uh, me, Mr. Pert, if uh, try to round it up in two okay. minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, 
um, one of our senior members about the progress we have made over the last uh, 30 years. And he was saying, you know, we, we had mass mobilization at the time of the hunger strikes. Uh, we've had mass mobilization at other times. Uh, and we weren't able to affect change. Uh, we have made much more progress and made far more many changes since we managed to get political power. And political power comes from the ballot box and, and people being elected. And that's, that's what brought us into negotiations. And negotiations, again, are another site of struggle. So I'll finish there. Uh, I suppose I could talk for another hour or so, uh, but I'll only be shouted at. Um, so there is no alternative to negotiations if you want to bring an end to the conflict, but there are a wide range of tactics that can be used if properly directed uh, to create favorable conditions for negotiations to take place. Thank you. Thank you, Bert, very much for your uh, presentation. And I think it is very insightful. And at the same time, it shows that the conflict, anyway, is passing more or less through the same stages. I think I, uh, I really liked your strategy, that you have a clear strategy of how to react and to mainly your first two strategic objectives. And I think it's good to learn, which is cohesion and unity. and. In the Palestinian context, that's what we really need to focus on because we really like this and we are segregated. And the other one is to have the national and international alliances. And I think these are very great lessons to learn from. Thank you very much for your uh, speech. I'd like now to give the floor to Carol Daniel. She's an old veteran friend and she is a PhD yeah. candidate at the school for conflict analysis at George Mason University, focusing on everyday resistance of Palestinians in East Jerusalem and West Bank, and on decolonization of resistance studies. She is a Palestinian conflict transformation scholar and professional working in the Middle East since 95, and she was a consultant for UNESCO's Div Division of Freedom of Expression, Democracy, and Peace for eight years, and she arranged large number of dialogue sessions among adversaries in different political contexts. Currently, she lives in Washington, D.C., and prior to that, she lived in East Jerusalem for 20 years and earned two degrees. Thank you very much. Carol, the floor is yours. Try to do it in 15 to 20 minutes. 20. Okay. 20. 20 American or 20 Western, not 20 Arab. Okay. طيب مساء الخير بس حبيت احييكم في العربي للاسف البرزنتيشن تبعي هي بالانجليزي لان فكرت الكونفرنس كله في الانجليزي بس معلش بدخل لي كم من كلمه عربي <تصفيق> اذا في امكانيه شكرا كمان مره لوجودي شكرا دكتوره دلال اول شيء انك عزمتيني هون اي فيل ريلي لاكي تو بي سبيندينغ ذا سمر ذا نيكست 3 مانثس ان بالستاين conducting my field research on resistance. I think it's a timely issue uh, at the moment, uh, uh, especially the issue of popular resistance, al And I'm really honored to be, um, I'm really honored to be among um, uh, 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 Dr. Riyad, Dr. Saeb, everybody here, you know, uh, and one of my closest friends, uh, Basim Tamimi, who has just joined us. Uh, uh, Ahed's father. Um, yes, please. Shukran kteer basim la talbi tak dawiti. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about is nothing new to most of you, uh, nothing to, to anyone, I guess, who, 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 who spoke about at any time about resistance or nonviolent resistance. I don't like to use the word nonviolent resistance, actually, but uh, that's the Western 
framework for whatever uh, 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 act that people under oppression uh, need to use in order to be uh, okayed or need to be politically correct. But what I'm going to do actually here is give a little bit of historical, um, historically what the Palestinian nonviolent resistance been like in the first intifada, what we can learn from the second one and what we have today in order to be able to see can we build on what we have? Can we go back to the past and say, can we take something from the first intifada and apply today? Unfortunately, according to many research and my personal one, it's not possible. But what we can do actually is more, is, is something that already started and which I was going to present in the second half of, of my presentation. So, uh, historically, when we talk about, and presently, when, when I ask Palestinians, when I ask anyone, when, you know, uh, when we talk about resistance or nonviolent resistance, it's totally different. When I say it in, Ar in, in Arabic, مقاومي, or مقاومي العنفية, it's totally different because in our mentality, مقاومي is something else. So, but nonviolent resistance, usually when I talk about it to people, usually they think about two schools of thought either Gandhi, the Gandhian one, or the Sharpian one. So there's no other kind of idea that there is something else going on. So, but on the ground, historically, Palestinians as groups and as individuals has pursued both ways, the Gandhian approach and the Sharpian approach. And what is the Gandhian approach? It's actually all those meetings with the Israelis trying to convince them of the other way, try to convert them, try to show, rather than reaching victory, we were trying to reach the truth. We were to convert them. And that was always the interfaith dialogue and people to people and all those funded programs and dialogues, which unfortunately I was part of after Oslo because I believed in them at certain points. And then the second one, um, which is the Sharpian uh, one, is the Palestinians also used during the first intifada where they tried to fulfill their goals. It's called the pragmatic approach, and it was very effective in the first intifada. Uh, but it's much less so in the second one, and even so today. Uh, because the tactics that you, you talked about, actually... Um, uh, 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 they're very similar in the first half, they're very similar to Northern Ireland. They included a full uh, range of acts of omission and commission uh, as defined by Sharp. They included protests, civil disobedience, strikes, demonstrations, name it. Everybody here lived it maybe or most of us here lived it uh, in the first intifada. Uh, we also, uh, uh, you know, uh, use change, international change of nonviolence, all those international people, and sometimes even Israelis uh, 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 joined in the first intifada at some point. So, however, the most effective methods and tactics to, to wield power, because in the end of the day, we're trying to wield power, Right? It's all about power. Against the occupation in the first intifada do not have the same impact in the second one or even today. So it's clear what the difference is between the first and the second and even the current resistance that occurs today is that the first one, people were acting together as one system. Unit, united around one purpose of statehood and to end the occupation and they were guided by coordination and most importantly discipline. While the second intifada and the present popular resistance one is not and has not been unified in target or purpose beyond defending their own personal properties, lands, or protecting the livelihood of local villages. There is a person which I interviewed, a veteran uh, from the first intifada. He told me, Carol, there is no unified command, there's no program, there's no real coordination between the different political factions or forces. The 87 intifada was a complete system which ruled our life, and the objective of the movement w was very clear. Today, no one knows what we want. So that lack of unity and discipline and organization, in my view, as a practitioner and as a researcher, cannot solely, really, it cannot only explain the failure. As most researchers, the Western researchers mostly say about the civil resistance, they argue. I argue that the structural, political, economic, geographic, and international condition dictating Palestinian life, especially since Oslo, and until this day, make it 
almost impossible for people to mobilize, to advocate, to create a movement. It has led, because of that, it has led to the fragmentation of the Palestinian territories through the construction of settlement, the separation wall, the disconnect from Israel, which uh, Neve Gordon says, it's not a colonization anymore, it's a separation. It's worse than colonization because it's fake. Uh, this makes it impossible for Palestinians to use their power of consent, which you used in Northern Ireland, or, or the obedience in, uh, uh, against the ruler and makes their choices of action very limited. So those you know, people who say we need to bring shops, 198 methods and tactics again to, 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 to reality here and use the theory of consent, I'm telling you, it's not effective, it's not relevant on the ground, it's not effective today for five reasons. And you know all those five reasons. First, the Palestinians and Israelis live separately, they function separately um, um, as if they are uh, separate states, but they're not, as established since Oslo. And the creation, the internal of external uh, 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 barriers and checkpoints and so on, they uh, create dependency so much on the occupier in almost every field of life. So this fragmentation really decreases the chances of coordinating any effort to participate in any action or even to mobilize or build a nonviolent campaign. Second one, second reason, the withdrawal of consent by Palestinians does not determine Israel's power regarding the occupation, especially because the same oppressor has the support of its own people. The inability of Palestinians today to mobilize any Israelis the left, the anti-Zionist, name it, anyone who is in Israel a little bit sympathizing with us, the inability of us to uh, mobilize them, to join their cause and have hundreds of people in the street demonstrating against the occupation, as happened in the First Intifada, at least a few episodes here and there, it, it created a situation where almost there's no, what we call in our field, no pillars of support um, on the other side, like in South Africa, we had the whites, which were the pillars of support for, um, uh, uh, for the uh, people of color in South Africa. So, uh, so, what, so even the withdrawal of consent by the Palestinians inside Israel, the 20%, even if they withdraw their consent, there has no whatsoever effect because of the law and because of the policies. Third, the Palestinian daily life and suffering caused by the occupation practices, unfortunately, they are invisible. They are invisible to the Israeli public eye, and I keep saying Israel, I'm not saying the international world. I am, if I want to change the situation, we need to work about the Israeli public eye. And do not, our suffering is so invisible because, because uh, first of all, the public has lost interest in what's happening in the West Bank because it does not affect its own life. It does not, um, uh, uh, it does not have whatsoever effect on their lives. For example, um, the Israeli, I, I, I used to watch the activists on the, on the wall. There were some demonstrations here and there. They're, they're covered almost by every media outlet I know except the Israeli media outlet. They're not covering any weekly protests anywhere unless it becomes bloody Unless there is an enemy that we need to kill, then, then it's, it's portrayed in the media as uh, perpetrators. Four, Israel has a complete, and this is the main issue with the boycott movement. Israel has a complete stranghold on the Israel Palestinian economy. It controls all imports, exports from the West Bank. Every product that goes in and out is monitored and orchestrated. So, by Israeli authorities, even Palestinian taxes, and you all know that, had to be collected by Israel and transferred to the PA. In addition, the restriction to movement does not allow Palestinians to really travel inside the West Bank in, or in many places to jobs, to banks, to trade, and so on. So, effective economic methods, such as boycotts, employed in the first intifada, I don't know if you know the Beit Sahur boycott, the East Jerusalem boycott, all the boycotts which worked, uh, it does not have the same impact today or influence to change the status quo. It might work internationally. It doesn't work here. I went around the supermarkets in, in Ramallah just to see if we have Israeli products, and they're all on our shelves, still on our shelves. So 
the boycott movement is very weak inside Palestine. It's trying to be powerful, but we have to make it powerful inside, first of all. So by weakening its, our economy, Israel, uh, 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 and our dependency on Israel, uh, the Oslo Accord took away all power from Palestinians, left them only, left that power only with the Palestinian Authority. Lastly, and last reason, internationally, Palestinians are extensively engaged with the UN and its different committees with foreign governments, including the United States, since 1990. However, the Palestinian, uh, the, the Palestinian diplomacy did not stop U.S. support to Israel, unlike East Timor, which yesterday they spoke about, or this, uh, today, or my research about Kosovo, Albanian, where the U.S. cut down its military support. The U.S. actually provided the economic and material support to Israel uh, uh, that is necessary to maintain its occupation. So all these reasons, these are all just, sorry, all these reasons and examples demonstrate how Palestinians living under external occupation are not in control, as we call it in our field, their resources to power. They're very far away from power, from, from accessing power. So they are geopolitically removed from both the sources of power and their neighbor society. So the withdrawal of consent by economic or political means cannot ch challenge the occupation. So this requires us to think differently about the capabilities and limitations of nonviolent resistance as defined by the Western civil resistance movements and all those theorists who try to tell us, do this and do that, where's your Gandhi, where's your shop, where's your, I don't know. So uh, what, what, what I'm trying to do in my research, and I argue that the concept of power and consent, which is based on controlling the power of the threatening political groups or regimes and using power to challenge one's own government is applicable for state actors and non-state actors in many places, historically and even today in Arab states, uh, in the Arab world, uh, but not in the Palestinian case. Because that same theory or that same lens as we look from, or sharp, does not imagine a context we're living in in which the oppressive regime is not dependent at all on our consent or on the consent of the governed. And this situation is not applicable to any other situation in the world that I studied. So, that being said, what can we do? And this is where I'm going with the title of this presentation. It's called Everyday Resistance. When I say it, people translated it into different things. They said daily resistance. They said nonviolent resistance. They said this. No, it is called Everyday Resistance. And what is that? Uh, I will say from what we have already. Uh, for, for, from, from what I've been noticing, the resistance of today and in the past 15 years, at least since 2003, I've been observing is different in character than the ones in the past. Its strategies has been altered to be more individualist, scattered, and organized, but they still aim to reject the power of occupation at any cost. As reflected by one of the activists, we will use all means. We will live in tents, fight with our limited means, although there is no strategic plan for popular resistance, we are not organized, but if we do not, do not make every day costly to the occupier, they will not leave. That's one of the activists who said that. The problem with that is that the Western researchers come and say, you know what, the Palestinian resistance is localized, is scattered, is not unified, is not coordinated, because they're looking at it, again, from the Sharpian or the Western lenses. They're looking at it from a certain way. But there are very few researchers around the world, and mostly they are Europeans and uh, Iranians, which I am following, like Asif Bayat and uh, James Scott, who did uh, a research on, in, in Iran and in Egypt and in Asia. And they, they, they saw that there is a resistance that is called, or this is a theoretical term that was developed by James Scott, it's called everyday resistance. And it actually describes a low profile, localized practices of subversion of power. And I argue that the Palestinian resistance today and the past 15 years takes this form 
due to the structural changes of the occupation and changes in the national and the international political uh, realm. So my objective actually this summer is try to explore the current practices that exist today of those petty acts or small acts of everyday nonviolent resistance uh, in the Palestinian territories and to learn about the extent to which de these daily practices uh, of subordinate group can actually undermine or influence uh, Israeli power even on a small scale. So if I refer to the indigenous term, which you all know, that we call sumud, right? You know the term. Everybody knows it. We were born with it. We, 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 we how do you say, nirda al-halib min sumud So I argue that it's actually... It actually articulates the everyday resistance, uh, forms of resistance, because it plays an active role in people's life. Uh, what, what, when I say everyday resistance, what do I mean? Let me give you examples. It means people smiling on the long uh, waiting line of checkpoint, refusing to respond to questions on checkpoint. I go to Ben-Gurion when I travel. I refuse to speak in Hebrew. I refuse... To, to answer uh, questions, uh, harvesting the olive oils or farming the land even when the access is restricted by soldiers, not allowing to being disrupted to reach your university or school or whatever it is by the checkpoint or by anything, standing in front of a bulldozer that is ready to demolish your house, changing the Hebrew signs in, in front of settlements of um, in, in, in settlements to Palestinian original names as Basim and his friends have done in front of the settlements uh, uh, in Nabi Saleh, not selling your land or houses to settler or any Israeli, protecting uh, local water resources in a village, farmers replanting olive oil trees after they've been uprooted, helping rebuilding houses of those previ previously right demolished. Atini bas okay. And even an individual out of the blue slapping a soldier on the face to undermine his power, uh, like Ahed did. And many, 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 many long list of other small acts that are practiced every day. So these, these small forms of, 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 of acts, or these acts are called actually in our uh, field infrapolitics because they are daily activities and tactics that exploited people use in order to both survive but also undermine repressive domination. So be, because we know organized resistance and rebellion is so risky in our context because people, what happened to people is they're uh, uh, are, 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 they are confronted with, with disciplinary power by Israel by being punished, imprisoned, killed, arrested, and so on and so forth. So people actually been practicing this is invisible politics to get to those small um, effects that can change our lives. So it's important to say, and I'm almost done, that these infrapolitics of Samud are not a substitute for movement. That's not what I'm saying. Or a substitute for another intifada in this case. But it is a condition, or it's an introduction to what follows. These acts of infrapolitics are complementary to visible resistance, or even after accumulation, and I'm talking about thousands and thousands of accumulation of such acts. It's a preface for a real resistance. As James Scott, and I'm quoting him, he said that under, in, in a book called Weapons of the Week, under the appropriate conditions, the accumulation of petty acts can rather like snowflakes on a steep mountainside set off an avalanche. So, so uh, no, one, no one here, even in the room, can comprehend the full-scale resistance, such as the two intifadas that we, we witnessed, without really understanding the offstage, what the people are doing on the ev every day, the offstage discourse and acts of Sumud that precedes it, accompany it, and is going to follow it. So from talking to people during the past few weeks here, I talked to scholars, activists. I'm going to keep talking for the next three months. There is an expectation and I am happy to come here and represent some of those grassroots and some of those people and say there is an expectation by people active in this sort of resistance that the leadership <coughs> at certain point would adopt the idea of clever resistance or everyday resistance in which daily practices of resistance by individuals could be developed into you know, further and be a part of a national strategic plan 
by empowering and supporting those segregated and scattered efforts. So, by answering the question where we go from here, I believe that in the absence of other strategies uh, or those who prove to fail like negotiations, armed resistance, organized mass mobilization and so on, there is a need to examine the unorganized forms of everyday resistance practiced by the individuals and which the Palestinians are already doing it. We're not reinventing the wheel. So why not build on it and empower it and make it part of a national strategic national plan? Why not support uh, Ahed and Basim and another Mundir and another this and another that and empower them and support them to be part of a bigger plan? Uh, it's, it's only by accumulation of these small creative acts everywhere that the Palestinians would gain, would feel again that they are part of a bigger thing. They're bigger than their village and they're bigger than their property and that they would appreciate a leadership that would work with the grassroots who have long experience in undermining or challenging the Israeli power. As Ad Muhammad Shtayi yesterday say, he actually said the same words yesterday. التراكم بالضربات وليس بالضرب القاضية الصمود هو حالة مش سلبية حالة مقاومة والسلطة الوطنية لازم تنتقل من سلطة خدمات لسلطة مقاومة I'm just repeating the same words It's, I just said it in English okay. Thank you Thank you Carol Thank you, Carol. I think the, uh, you have raised lots of uh, questions and uh, I will move directly to Dr. Saeb Arikat, who is well known, and but anyway, I have to introduce him again. He is the Secretary General of the uh, of the Palestinian Liberation Organization Executive Committee, the Head of Negotiation Affairs Department, and Chief Palestinian Negotiator. He was the Head of Negotiations Affairs Department in '95, and he was and he served as a Minister of Local Governance Government in '94. And he used to be a professor in political science at Al-Najah in the 80s. And he has a PhD in peace studies from Bradford University in 83. Uh, I, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Saeb, as we all know him, he is, very, uh, uh, he, he is the lead negotiator of the Palestinian peace process. And in this conference, we are talking about alternatives of negotiations. And we need, and the audience need to know what are these alternatives? And how can we encounter the current aggressive uh, political dictation of Trump administration and Israeli administration uh, and react and seize all this expansion of settlements and uh, unilateral actions? Uh, what is our strategy in this regard? And I leave the floor to our key speaker, Dr. Saab. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Nidal, Pat, Carol. Pat, uh, Mr. Tamimi entered the room. Uh, he has a daughter, Ahad. She's now 16. She slapped an Israeli soldier, and she got an eight-month sentence with her little hand. And uh, when people speak about resistance, the mere fact that we have Ahad Tamimi, the icon of our dignity, our pride, and the road to our independence. Uh, before I put me in a position to speak about negotiations or dictations, and uh, before I address the question where to, I would like to say a word or two about where we are. And I'll begin with Israel. We don't have an Israeli partner. Mr. Netanyahu is not a two-stater. And he believes now that he can dictate what I term as one state, two systems. Apartheid. He believes he can do it. He believes that the ongoing developments in the Arab world, the division between the Palestinians, the change in the United States, have paved the way for dictating a solution on Palestinians, 
one state, two systems, means one word, apartheid. And if, if I, sitting with you, and then I don't see this water here, I'm sure Naime and my kids will take me to therapy. If I ignore the fact that I see this, usually as an individual, I should be taken to therapy. And when nation states believe that ignoring facts means they don't exist, we don't know what to do with it. And that's what Israel is all about today. They have a government that believes that ignoring facts means they don't exist. They are exerting every possible effort, Netanyahu, to keep uh, Gaza separate from the West Bank. Under no circumstances, I want to remind everyone here that 23rd of April 2014, Netanyahu suspended the negotiations with us when Azam al-Ahmed signed the Shata Agreement with Hamas. And the whole scheme of Sharon's uh, redeployment from Gaza was to split the West Bank and Gaza because they have realized, strategically speaking, that there will not be a state in Gaza and there will not be a state without Gaza. So to, to, to kill the Palestinian National Project, they want to maintain the division in Gaza under any circumstances. As far as the U.S. is concerned, we also don't have a U.S. partner. Uh, we did not pick a fight with the U.S. As a matter of fact, I, still, I think as Palestinians we hold the records of those who met more with President Trump and his colleagues. We have had 35 meetings in total with the Trump administration, four at the summit level and 31 meeting at my level. And we gave this administration every possible chance in order to retrieve the position of two states to live and let live and to achieve as just an agreed solution based on international law and the agreed terms of reference where the state of Palestine with the East Jerusalem's capital will live side by side the state of Israel peace and security on the 1967 lines and then a solution to all core issues including refugees and prisoners in accordance with the relevant Security Council or General Assembly resolution. In May, on May 3rd, uh, we were at the White House. I acknowledge Ambassador Zumlot was with us. He's with us here also. Uh, President Trump promised us that he will not uh, take any action that may preempt or prejudge issues reserved for permanent status. And he said that he will give it his best chance for a year and then he will take action against the side that will be an impediment or an obstacle to peace. And then uh, all of a sudden, uh, President Trump decided to adopt Netanyahu's positions fully. Uh, I was with them, with Mr. Zumlut and Mr. Farage, the chief intelligence of the Palestinian Authority, I think it was November 30th, the, la the last meeting we were at the White House. And then they were supposed to sign the waiver to move the embassy, not to move the embassy on the, on the 1st of December. And they told us they will not. So I told them, yeah, if you don't sign the waiver, you would have disqualified yourself from any role in the peace process. And Mr. Koshner responded to me saying, don't threaten us. I said, I don't threaten nobody. I'm just giving you a heads up. You recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. You decide to move the embassy. You are not a partner. You are not a facilitator. You are not a sponsor. And you'll have no place in the negotiating room with us. That's it. And then, if the art of the US negotiations means that so far they have used everything in their pocket. The PLO is a terrorist organization. They had passed the Taylor Force, cutting aid of Palestinians. They dried the sources of UNRWA by cutting their 70% of the budget of UNRWA. They moved the embassy and recognized Jerusalem's capital. They did not even say two states on the 1967 lines. What they said were, was, Two states, if both parties agreed, actually they gave Netanyahu a veto on this. And then settlements are no longer illegal as far as this administration is concerned. These are 
the American position. So they managed to put me in a position as a negotiator where, they, where I have nothing to lose. And today, what is Mr. Kushner doing in the region and what, what he's doing here? He's here for the second step of dictating, dictating the so-called deal of the century. Now, then they believe that Jerusalem is at the table. Now it's time to terminate and eliminate UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency. So they're approaching the host countries, telling them how much does it cost UNRWA spending in Jordan this amount, we will pay you directly to the government, we don't need UNRWA. That's what they will say to the Lebanese, the Syrians, because once UNRWA is eliminated, then they believe they drop the file of refugees. That's dictating. Number three, uh, they, in security-wise, they're open about it. Israel should have the overriding security responsibility for airspace, territorial water, international passages, remain in the Jordan Valley. And uh, they believe that they dictate, they can dictate uh, this on us. And the third mission now, they want a regime change in the West Bank. Mr. Justin Re Re Greenblatt is on the record. He wrote an article in Arabic and in English, published in Haaretz and Al-Quds newspaper, saying that Palestinians deserve better leadership than the ones we have here. And he used my name saying that if I continue my hallucination, refusing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, I don't deserve to be uh, talking on behalf of Palestinians. So I think in this step, this, this regime change is going to be translated very soon into trying to throw us into chaos, lawlessness, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, they, you know, in 1953, uh, Mr. Mossadegh wasn't killed by the Americans. <laughs> Some Iranians killed him. So with A&D in 1972, with anyone, we're not saying that the U.S. is not a superpower. We did not choose to fight the U.S. We did not choose to confront the U.S. But these people believe that they can dictate a solution. And if, they, and if we refuse to dictate a solution, we're not partners. We're not uh, we're terrorists. We are, we are, we are, whatever we are. And we tell them, look, I think since Eve negotiated Adam, I'm the most disadvantaged negotiator in the history of mankind, Pat. unlike you. I have no army, no navy, no air force, no economy. My people are fragmented. And Israel is a country with 5,000 tanks, 3,000 fighting planes, nuclear weapons. If it's my war against the Congress, the Senate, I'm dead. I don't, life is not about fairness and justice. But having said all of this, having said all of this, the Trump administration is not a partner for me in the peace process. They will not be a partner for me in the peace process. They chose to disqualify themselves. They are the ones who walked away from the table. Because some people say, why do you, what, do you, what do you say when the Americans offer something and you say no? What do, why do you walk away from the table? We did not walk away from the table. They did. They did when they declared Jerusalem as Israel's capital. We did not walk away from the terms of reference specified for making peace. They did. All right? And we're no match to the, in military power to the United States. But the U.S., as far as we're concerned, is not a partner in the negotiations. They have chosen the wrong side of history. They have chosen to take the driving seat from Netanyahu, actually. And for the first time since 1948, the U.S., the United States of America, has no ambassador in Tel Aviv. The United States of America has no ambassador in the U.N., these ambassadors, Friedman and Haley, are ambassadors of children adults. That is the honest truth. And Franklin D. Roosevelt, an American president, once said, the White House is an office of international morality. And that's the truth. Because the more power you have, the more responsibility you, you should have. And today, what we need for the White House to be an office of international morality are giant statesmen not real estate agents. That's the truth. As far as we're concerned as Palestinians, we know they have never shared a word with us, or for that matter, for, for, with anybody on the end game. Uh, they kept asking us questions for 35 meetings. 
<laughs> we responded to them, I think I respond, I repeated myself 35 times, if not more, to each single issue. Now, they think Jerusalem is off the table, refugees off the table, security, uh, Israel overriding security responsibility, uh, Israel presence in the Palestinian state, because this state will be with limited sovereignty, limited sovereignty means li limited dignity, and you know, you can use the, the term uh, limited arms, but don't ever try to impose the concept of limited dignity on any people. This will not be doable to anyone. This will not be doable. Uh, the fourth reason they're here now is Gaza. Having cut 70% of UNRWA's aid, that serves 80% of Gaza population who are refugees, now the humanitarian Trump administration is moving in the direction of Gaza. Gaza, a state in Gaza, all right? And I think they were notified by Netanyahu yesterday that anything that Gaza needs, you know, they collect our taxes for us, our revenues for us. Netanyahu made the commitment to cut it directly and send it to Gaza if that's needed, just to keep the Gaza strip separate from the West Bank because the realization to them is that they can have a state, a sieged state called, called uh, Gaza. This is the situation. We cannot dictate. We are with negotiations. Negotiations is not, as you said, but uh, an end, it's the means. And we stand firm on the basis of international law. We are with what the international community specified as the term of reference for this solution, the relevant Security Council General Assembly resolutions. Two states, live and let live, the state of Palestine with East, with East Jerusalem's capital to live side by side, the state of Israel, peace and security. We have a joint statement with the European Union, 22nd of January, in, in this position, and we appreciate very much that the EU stood tall and shoulder to shoulder with us. On the 29th of January, we had the same thing with the African Union, in the same stand, standing next to us. Before that, December 13th, we had the OIC, Organization of Islamic Countries, uh, specifying that position. Same thing was applicable in the Arab world, Dahran uh, Summit, and also from the uh, non-aligned movements and uh, South American uh, and, and, and Central American countries. These are the positions. Uh, and uh, when we went to the United Nations recently for a resolution in the General Assembly after being vetoed at the Security Council on international protection, I mean, everything was done. I think a country like Ghana is doing a $1.6 million uh, health rehabilitation center. Because they voted for us, they were cut. They will not finish it by the Americans because Haley was taking notes of countries who vote uh, against or with. I think they cut another $1 million from a school being built in Mozambique. This is the new international morality and international system. And maybe when you said that you have 40 million uh, Irish in the United States, maybe it's your chance. If the price is right, you could have Northern Ireland back. And honestly, because this administration cannot be predicted if the price is right, if you have 40 million uh, Irish and if you can show that the price is right, there is no, no binding, there is no international law, no terms of reference, no basis for uh, human rights. I mean, the, the, two, the two most important persons in Trump's life today are Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel and Kim Jong-un of North, North, North Korea. He has opened now a new trade war that involves Canada, involves Europe, involves China, involves the whole world. I really still have to study the impact of this trade war uh, on us. The question for us as Palestinians, I don't think it's going to be whether we can negotiate or dictate. Israel will not negotiate with us. They believe they can dictate. I cannot dictate on the Israelis. So we're employing what I call BATNA. BATNA, since I'm in a resolution center, is translated into Dalal, best, best alternative to a negoti negotiated agreement. So what is my BATNA? What is my best alternative to a negotiated agreement? Number one, I will stay the course 
with the two-state solution. I will stay the course on the basis of international law. I will stay the course with our full partners in the international community. Palestine is a, a country that will be very responsible for human rights, women's rights, accountability, transparency, the rule of law, one authority, one gun. And by the way, I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not saying we don't commit mistakes. We do commit mistakes. Not that we wake up in the morning and say today we gotta go and commit the following mistakes. We're 20 years of age and we crawl and sometimes we don't differentiate between freedom of expression or incitement. So we need the help of all countries that can help us in developing our institutions. I didn't have to wait 50 years to learn how to do elections. I signed an agreement with the EU when I was the central election head and they helped us a great deal. Uh, we, some people worried about us being blamed by moving uh, from the table, whatever. That's behind us. That's behind us. People know, the international community knows that Palestinians have recognized the state of Israel, have accepted nonviolence, in any term you want to put it, Carol put it, uh, have accepted uh, many things that in the negotiations in order to achieve peace because, to be honest, I did not wake up one morning and felt my conscience aching for the suffering of Israelis, I said to them. No one benefits more from reaching an agreement, peace agreement, more than us, and no one stands to lose more in the absence of peace more than Palestinians. So it's our vital interest uh, to do so. Riyad Mansour, I think, went through what we uh, are doing, and Omar and from the foreign ministry. We are working now not sequential. We cannot afford to work sequential. One, two, three, we have to work parallel. As far as the international community is concerned, we are implementing the resolutions of our National Council in terms of going to the Security Council for international protection. We have a veto. Then we move to the General Assembly and we got it. Now what will become after that, I think Riyadh will be working for the International Court of Justice on a resolution that will declare Trump's decision on Jerusalem as null and void and, and a flagrant violation of international law. I hope you choose your terms, the right ones, you know, for, for this uh, resolution. We are also, we have made a full referral for the International Criminal Court. And those who worry about going to courts, I think they should not commit crimes. If you don't like to go to courts, you should not commit crimes. So you don't tell Palestinians not to go to courts, you tell the criminals who commit crimes who jail Ahad Tamimi, who murder Razan Najjar, who murder Shaban, uh, the, the, uh, Mr. Shaban, the legless Palestinian uh, who was killed in, in, in Gaza and the Israeli army celebrated the, the shooting. So in the absence of the possibility of any negotiations on the two-state solution, because we call, we, uh, my president went to, President Abbas went to the Security Council in February 20th and introduced the vision of peace, the eight points, uh, two states, and he wanted to have mechanisms of an international umbrella guided to, uh, got to guide the parties towards implementing the relevant resolutions leading to the two-state solution and ending the occupation that began 6-7. Uh, to be honest with you, I, you know, if we're gonna take ourselves, you know, speak, strategically speaking, uh, the EU wants this. The EU is not one foreign policy. The EU is 28 foreign policies. But the, 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 the thing that we want from the EU is to give us a commitment. Uh, we have been asking them to recognize the state of Palestine because if you, ta if you say two states in Ireland, we were the two states, you, sub you recognize the two states, not one state. I ha had a recent meeting with the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, and it's up to you. I cannot force any country, but if you want to maintain the two-state solution, you recognize France should lead the way, Ireland, Belgium, Luxembourg, to recognizing the state of Palestine with East Jerusalem's capital, if you want to maintain the two-state solution. But don't ask me alone to take the risks of continuing this and just, uh, this, that's up to you. I cannot interfere in, in such politics. In the absence of the possibility of serious negotiations or dictations, what do we have? We have two options. Netanyahu's option of one state, two systems, apartheid, which is not doable, I can assure you it's not doable. It's not going to work. And there are some Palestinians who are advocating now one state equal rights, which is a very civilized concept where Jews, Muslims, and Christians can 
live equally. Very, very civilized. Yes, yes. I don't, I don't disagree with this, but it's not doable. Israel, no Israeli will accept this. For a simple fact, today, the 23rd of June, 2018, between my hometown, Jericho, and the River Jordan, and the Tel Aviv and the Mediterranean, 50.9% are me, 49.1% are Netanyahu. And I don't think that the Israelis, uh, in, in the current development, uh, you know, occupation corrupts. And uh, when, you, when you go the path of maintaining the occupation, that leads to apartheid. And such diseases as bigotry and racism, once they inflict underneath our skins, as any human beings, without exceptions, we had had a tendency to justify it. Sometimes we give sociological, psychological, economic, sexual, and now Israel is using the term security reasons. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It corrupts. There is no difference between a thug and a murderer who slit the throat of a Western journalist in Iraq and Syria under the name ISIS, and between a thug and a murderer who burns the Dawabshi family in Duma. That is the honest truth. There are kids today, Jewish kids today, coming from Europe and the United States, from lower, upper, or middle, upper class families who believe they come and harm Palestinians very closer to God. I don't think you want them, if they go back to France, you want them to be your neighbors. That's not good. That's not good. So that's option of Israel, one state, two systems, is not going to work. One state, equal rights is not going to work. So what will happen? There will be a vacuum. And we live now in this vacuum. This vacuum will lead either to enlarge the cycle of violence, counter-violence, and bloodshed. And I think Israel, by treating and uh, committing the crimes of human, against humanity in dealing with the marches, peaceful marches of return in Gaza, and we expressed there to the whole world, we're ready to do it. We will let them swim in their blood. And their, their, their defense minister went to the extent as saying, no innocent people in Gaza. So that's a green light to kill every Gaza. It's, it cannot be more obvious than this. It cannot be more obvious uh, than this. Uh, then, Mr. Trump wants to defeat terrorism, wants to defeat ISIS. We want to defeat terrorism. We want to defeat ISIS. But I don't think that Mr. Trump has developed the techniques to kill ideas with bullets. Ideas cannot be killed with bullets. My body can be killed with bullets. Ideas are not killed with bullets. No one can kill ideas with bullets. And no one can prevent ideas to travel with or without visas. Ideas travel especially bad ones. they intercontinental. They cross borders. No permission from anyone. So to defeat, if they, if they, if they, they determine to defeat terrorism, the first thing that must be defeated is the Israeli occupation. The end of the Israeli occupation is a must. And on the Arab side, we have to take full account of our situation. The real threat on us now is demography. 57% of us as Arabs are less than 18 years of age. It's time of, of needs, jobs, husbands, wives, apartments, and we need to total uh, to visit our economic structure, political structure, our people's participation in government, uh, accountability, transparency, women's rights, and human rights. We will, we will, we will continue pursuing building our institutions in this direction, hoping to cook to limit our mistakes to the, to the minimum. And as far as Hamas is concerned, Hamas is a Palestinian political party. And we have political pluralism. And yes, we will have a policy of zero tolerance to authority pluralism. There's a big difference between authority pluralism and authority pluralism. Any country that gets the disease of authority pluralism as the U.S. after 100 years of independence, when the contradictions erupted between the North and South. Half a million people killed. Ask Afghanistan, ask Algeria, ask Lebanon, ask any country. 
that got the disease of multiple authorities. تعدد دية سياسية شيء تقوم عليه فلسطين وتعدد السلطات من المحرمات. تعدد السلطات من المحرمات. والمسؤول السياسي المسؤول اللي بقول للناس الحكي اللي لازم يسمعوه مش الحكي اللي بيحبوا يسمعوه. مواجهتنا لصفقة القرن if we're gonna face the dictations of Israel and Trump the first thing that needed is to end the coup in Gaza. The first step. And what we're telling Hamas when we differ and we differ it's ballots and not bullets. It's ballots and not bullets. What are we asking Hamas to do? We're not even asking for an apology in the coup they committed. We're asking for them, we have formed together a national consensus government to empower this government and then to decide on a date to go back to the people in general elections. That's how we defeat the dictation of Trump because the only bad path for Trump and Netanyahu towards achieving the destruction of the Palestinian National Project, as they think, the independent Palestinian state with the Jerusalem capital, is the continuation of the coup d'etat of Hamas in Gaza. That is the truth. And it should end. And it should end by accepting the principle of going back to the ballots, the Palestinian people to decide. And those Palestinians who try to carry the stick from the middle, all right, I think we should really think very seriously about our batna. This is the most important ingredient in our, I don't want to say strategy, but let me say strategy, strategic thinking towards the future. It's our unity. It's ending the coup. It's uh, finishing the situation and, 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 and reunifying the West Bank and Gaza. Because once again, there will never be a state in Gaza, and there will never be a state without Gaza. That is the honest truth. Secondly, we need to continue our international partnership with the EU, with the African Union, the land movement, Africa, Asians, whoever believes in international law and the two-state solution, and solving problems peacefully, non-violence, and through uh, negotiations we are ready for once the terms of reference are very specified within a time frame, within a ceiling, and within the new international uh, umbrella. Our positions are very, very clear on this, and we will continue pursuing uh, this. We will continue pursuing seeking international uh, uh, protection, a human rights council and the investigation committee, accession to the specialized agencies will happen, I mean, the U.S. withdrew from UNESCO, they drew from the Human Rights Council, and yes, we are thinking seriously of joining WHO, FAO, WIPO, Chicago Convention. It's our full right to join and make accession to all these specialized agencies, and we, as a matter of fact, we're working, we're preparing, and we're working on it. We're already at the International Criminal Court hoping that the ICC will open an, an investigation. And the uh, last thing I'm going to say, and uh, as far as the one state reality is concerned, we are here and we are here to stay. We're going to continue our institution building. We're going to continue being here. We don't intend to disappear. And we really want peace. We want our people to be living normally as any other people on earth. But having done all what was done by the Palestinian leadership, the PLO, in accepting international law, the rule of law, it's time for the international community to stand tall and hold Israel accountable. Accountability towards Israel is the road to peace and security in the region. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Saeb, for your uh, information and for sharing your experience. I think this is very thorough and detailed uh, description of our situation. Uh, we leave the floor now to your questions, and uh, we'll have, uh, please, once you ask the question, introduce yourself, your work, and to whom you are addressing this question. Please. 
شكرا اسمي حمد اجا بس راح يكون في لي كمان سؤال لما دكتور علاقات يرجع اوكي فتحي شكرا كيفك شو اخبارك تفضل تفضل لو سمحت ايه سؤالي لكارول كورال كارول بخصوص المقاومه الشعبيه برايك ايش الاختلاف الرئيسي ما بين الانتفاضه الاولى والثانيه والوقت الحاضر اللي بيمنع قيام انتفاضه شعبيه واسعه مع انه يعني انت بتحكي انه الظروف مش ملائمه مع انه اللي بنشوفه بغزه او الطريقه اللي بنشوفها بغزه لو بدها تكون بالضفه الغربيه زائد كمان في 48 في الداخل الاثر تبعها راح يكون مضاعف بشكل كبير الاثر تبعها على المجتمع الاسرائيلي على الاقل اللي خلي خليهم يشعروا اصلا انه اصلا في احتلال المقاومه الشعبيه برايك لو يكون شعارها انهاء الابارتايد اللي هو عمليا متخبي هذا يعني دكتور علاقات بيحكي انه ابارتايد ولكن واضح لنا ولكن هو مش واضح لل لل للانترناشونال كوميونيتي كشعوب اكيد الدبلوماسيين بيعرفوا هذا الشيء ولكن الشعوب مش مش عارفين حقيقه الابارتايد الموجود في فلسطين اللي هو انا برايي مش عارفين لانه متخبي وراء السلطه الفلسطينيه وبالتالي الناس او كمان هذا على الموضوع التضامن الشعوب معنا هلا صفت عندهم الفكره بعد اوسلو من اوسلو لهلا انه الفلسطينيين اوريدي كانهم اخذوا الدوله تبعتهم وضايل كم من مساله هون وهون صغير وهيهم بفوضوا عليها ولكن وين السؤال اذا ممكن سؤال مباشر لانه و... عندنا كثير اسئله يا زلمه سؤالي هل هي بتعتقد انه وجود السلطه الفلسطينيه هو المعيق امام انتفاضة شعبية شاملة سلمية شكرا اوكي شكرا ناخذ كمان اسئلة وبنجاوب مع بعض تفضل استاذ عندك ارجع طيب بس بدي احكي على قضية ال تفضل يا ريت يا جماعة نسأل بشكل مباشر عشان ناخذ اكبر حجم من الاسئلة اذا بدي ممكن بدي احكي عن قضية انه جمهورية ايرلندا يعني بين البريطانيين بعرفش وال يعني بيختلف الوضع عن الفلسطينيين، هدول نفس الملة ونفس الدين ونفس القومية ونفس العرق إلى آخره، فانحلت. أما هدول اللي أجوا الواحد مش عارف منين أبوه ومش عارف منين جده، أه أو جده بجوز بولوني، بقول لك أنا إلي عايش هون في أرض فلسطين. أه يعني في فرق إن ها وها بيدعم يعني أمريكا في ظهره، في دول عربية في ظهر الاحتلال صار، الإمارات، السعودية، مصر صاروا في ظهر الاحتلال. احنا ليش قاعدين من 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 لوم الامريكان؟ دكتور صابع رقاد حكيت انه احنا بدنا نعمل يعني تنهوا الانقسام. انا برايي بدك تنهي الانقسام بده يكون في توافق للشعب الفلسطيني انه اذا بيجي اي شخص اي فئه تيجي تحكم انها ما تحكم لحالها تحكم الجميع يحكم معها، جميع الفصائل مستقلين. ما بدنا يتفرد حماس في غزه ولا فتح في الضفه. اثنين انتم متفردين يا نحكي بالمشرمح يا جماعه بدنا اسئله ما بدنا قلتوا راح تد... مز... قرارات مجلس المركز راح ت... تسحبوا الاعتراف باسرائيل ما سحبتوش قلتوا راح توقفوا التنسيق الامني ما وقفتوش شيء طب شو بعدين يعني ضلكم تكذبوا على الناس يعني بكفي لان الناس عايفه حالها عايفه حالها الناس يعني مش عارف الناس في 80 مليون من الشعب مدان للبنوك في ناس مش بلاك توكل في ناس مش عارفه تتعلم، في ناس مش قادره تتعالج استاذ لو سمحت يعني قصد منه سؤال سؤال مش سؤال. انا حكيت حكيت انه انتهاء الانقسام يعني زي اقتراح عشان في كثير اسئله ماشي مين. اما بالنسبه للمقاومه وصلت لو سمحت للاخت بس المقاومه بتحكي عنها هل هناك فرق بين المقاومه الشعبيه والمقاومه السلميه والم... انا تمام. بالنسبه لي المقاومه الشعبيه تتضمن يا جماعه السلاح المقاومه الشعبيه سلاح مش مقاومه سلميه ما بدنا يا سلميه احنا في عنا احتلال مستوطن في اي لحظه بطخك وبقتلك الغرب بيسالوش فيك بقول لك مهضر هاب انقتل اما اذا جرحت طفلة اسرائيليه بقيموا عليك قيام الغرب سالت سؤالين واضحين شكرا لك لان فضل. اوروبا اللي صنعت اسرائيل ما بتوقع انها راح تنصف الشعب لو الفلسطيني يعطيكم العافيه لا غيرك لو سمحت اعطي مجال تفضل استاذ لا ما حد بقول لك جامل بس سالت كثير 
رجاء اسئله مباشره okay. بس ما بدنا تعقيب ولا تعليق اونلي كويستشنز بليز ماي نيم از بدو قواسمي ام سيفل انجينير طيب تفضل بالسؤال بالله لو سمحت تفضل Uh, my question is to Pat Sheehan uh, about Ireland. I want to understand that usually the terrorist of one nation is viewed as the freedom fighter for another and vice versa. My question is uh, to you is how the IRA and the Sinn Féin, the Sinn Féin is the military uh, arm of the uh, IRA if I'm not mistaken, uh, how was it viewed by the majority of the Irish people? So were there This is not by the British, but the majority. Was it seen partially as an oppressive faction, or was it were were people totally with it? Were there other uh, competing factions? Uh, w- what was that kind of uh, relationship? Just to understand uh, the IRA, Sinn Féin versus uh, Hamas, Fatah, uh, as I view them today. I personally view both Fatah and Hamas as oppressive uh, factions. Uh, they do not provide me with the uh, with the freedoms that I hoped for. Their political agendas do not uh, represent my ambitions uh, towards Pal- the Palestine that I viewed. I see Fatah more as the uh, as the secular, uh, which I c- kind of prefer. Hamas is kind of the religious oppressive regime, which I totally uh, counter. But at the same time, both do not. Uh, fully represent my hopes, my ambitions for the future of Palestine. So I wonder what was the case in Ireland in that respect. Were okay. There... We have, we can take another couple of questions and then we'll listen. Yes, please. Fadal, <laughs> ilak. Yes. Okay, thank you. Dima Abu Maria from the Media Line. I have two questions for Mrs. Carroll and uh, Mr. Saeb. My first question, um, I believe you mentioned that the Palestinian struggle is invisible because it does not affect the Israeli public eye. That's, okay, but yeah, because I didn't understand it well, because the Israeli, um, the Palestinian struggle is invisible to a lot of other nations and populations, and still they have the full support from them. So please, can you clarify it? Mr. Saeb, um, you mentioned that Kushner is cruising. Um, You mentioned that Kushner is um, cruising between the Arab nations, Um, offering them money, direct money, rather than give it to the UNRWA. Can I please know the price for that? Or what's, what, what are the Arab nations are going to give in return for okay. these amounts? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hon, hon. Mash. Isam Barahmi, I'm from the Muhammi, and I'm a student of the Palestinian Society in the American Society. I have a question for Dr. Saeb. دكتور انت حكينا ان نحن ملتزمين بحدود 67 وقرار التقسيم وما الى ذلك لكن في ظل تعثر المفاوضات وقرار القياده الفلسطينيه بوقف الوساطه الامريكيه هل هناك قوى دوليه جاهزه لكي تلعب دور الوسيط في هذه المفاوضات ام اننا امام خلق واقع جديد وحقائق جديده على الارض قد نضطر الى التفاوض عليها مستقبلا في حال قبولها او لا تختلف عما هو الان السؤال الثاني هل تعتقد أن قرار وقف اقتطاع عائدات الضريبة وتحويلها إلى غزة جزء من بداية فعلا محاولة لخلق قيادة جديدة على الساحة الفلسطينية ومحاولة قلب النظام كما تحدث وشكرا أوكي بكفي الآن نسمع الإجابات أنا عارف أنه أنا مبسوط أنه في أسئلة كتير بس يعني we have to give them time to answer تفضلوا في احنا دكتور نضال وعدنا الاستاذ هناك في بده يوجه سؤال للدكتور صايب اه اوكي تفضل بس سؤال لو سمحت مش خطبه آه. دكتور عريقات بخصوص كمان استبدال القياده هل عندكم اي تصورات عن السيناريوهات اللي ممكن تتجه لها امريكا او حلفائها لاستبدال القياده واذا اه ايش ايش كمان سيناريوهاتكم لاحباطها وخاصه انه تعرف دكتور انه الثقة ما بين القيادة والشعب اولموست زيرو فعمين مركنين اذا يعني يعني ما بتصورش الشعب انه راح يدافع عن القيادة في حال تعرضت لاي محاولة لاستبدالها إيه انا انا بتحب اعطيك الحل اللي هو اللي هددت فيه القيادة عمليا من يمكن من 2008 اللي هو حل السلطة الفلسطينية 
اللي وصفوا نتنياهو بالنايت مير واللي بعد التهديدات هاي بالعشرات وما كانش في اي قرار عرف انه الفلسطينيين مش جديين في هذا الموضوع فبرايي هذا اللي ممكن كمان هو حل السلطه الفلسطينيه هو اللي ممكن يرجع الثقه بشك ب 24 ساعه ما بين القياده والشعب وبعد حل السلطه اكيد يرجع الاهتمام او الارتكاز او الثقل لمنظمه التحرير الفلسطينيه والاستمرار في في حل الدوله الواحده ديمقراطيه بس تكونها منظمه تحرير أوكي. تكون ممثله طيب. كل الشعب الفلسطيني شكرا تفضل خلينا نبدا بمعظم الاسئله دكتور صائب نبدا بدكتور صائب وبعدين نسمع كارول تفضل دكتور اخ سائد انت غلطان بالنسبه لمصر او بالنسبه للامارات وبالنسبه للسعوديه وبالنسبه للاردن ما خذ مني بحكي لك معلومات يعني انا كنت في مصر من اسبوعين اجتماع ثلاثي اردني مصري فلسطيني وكنت اول امبارح في الاردن بناء دعوه انا ورئيس جهاز المخابرات الفلسطينيه مع الاخ وزير الخارجيه ورئيس جهاز المواقف العربيه وانا مسؤول اون ذا ريكورد حطوها انه قيل للامريكان نحن موقفنا نحن لن نكون وسطاء مع الفلسطينيين او بدلاء للفلسطينيين نحن مع مبادره السلام العربيه دون تغيير الحل الوحيد دوله فلسطين مستقله بعاصمتها القدس الشرقيه على حدود رابع حزيران 67 هذا هو موقف مصر العربيه السعوديه الامارات والقطر والاردن وجميع الدول العربيه دون استثناء وخذها قاعده يعني هذا هي الحقيقه اما محاولات نتنياهو يوحي عشان يزيد حاله الاحباط وحاله الياس وحاله الشعب الفلسطيني انه فتحنا علاقات وكذا بتحداه بس شغله واحده فرجيني الصوره له مع مع قائد عربي اذا عنده هالثقه بالنفس بتحد بتحداه بتحداه تحدي يعني لاني بعرف انه يكذب فبالتالي لا احنا ظهرنا عربي ظهر متين وقمه الظهران واضحه ومحدده وسميت قمه القدس وما كتبناه في بيانها الختامي هو ما اعتمد بالكامل عربيا وبالنسبه كمان للاتحاد الاوروبي سمعت فيدريكا موغريني في في الظهران وفي بروكسل الحل بالنسبه لاوروبا دوله فلسطين المستقله بعاصمتها القدس الشرقيه لما يكون العالم معك بهالدرجه كمان بلاش تقعد نقعد نلطم حالنا 138 دوله معترفه بدوله فلسطين اليوم في اخر تصويت في الامم المتحده 120 صوت لك ضد ثمانية امريكا تقول انت دوله مانحه انت ولا مساعد حدا والعالم واقف معك لانك انت واقف لانه قضيتك عادله قضيتك قويه لانك صمدت ورفضت الذوب لانك انت 13 مليون فلسطيني ما فيش فرق بين فلسطيني بيعيش في نيكاراغوا وفلسطيني بيعيش في رام الله وفلسطيني بيعيش في رفح وفلسطيني بيعيش في القدس وفلسطيني بيعيش في عين الحلوه الوطنيه الفلسطينيه اليوم تعني مقدار ما بيقدمه كل منا من خدمات لمجتمعه في مجال تخصص لاعاده فلسطين لخارطه الجغرافيا نقطه نقطه القضيه الفلسطينيه في المستقبل مش حاجه فهلوه ولا حاجه لشعارات بدي الطبيب الفلسطيني حتى يكون وطني توصل لاخر كلمه واخر تطور في مجال علومه لان المقاومه بالنسبه لي على رغم احترامي الست كارل على طول خط للدكتوره كارل وجودي على الارض مقاومه جامعتي مدرستي مزرعتي صناعتي طريقه تفكيري اخلاقي ادبي فهمت علي؟ فبالتالي لا لما بتشوف كم الانجازات الهائله اللي تحقق فلسطينيا اليوم ما ما تقعد يعني تحاول توزع او تزرع الياس للناس انت قلت قررت المجلس الوطني الفلسطيني لم ننفذ ذكرت شغلتين سحب الاعتراف في اسرائيل والتنسيق الامني لكن في 12 بند من قرارات المجلس الوطني نفذت 12 بند نفذت وانا مسؤول عن اللجنه سجل عيدك الذهاب لمحكمه الجنائيه الدوليه الريفيرال حصل الذهاب الى مجلس الامن راح حصلنا الذهاب الى الجمعيه العامه المتحدين من اجل السلام حصل تشكيل لجنه عليا لقطاع غزه وهي على وشك ان تنهي عملها وتقدم مشروع قرار للوحده الوطنيه في غزه مجلس حقوق الانسان في لجنه تقصي حقائق محكمه العدل الدوليه لاصدار قرار مش راي استشاري قرار يعتبر قرار الرئيس ترامب باطل ولاغي وغير قانوني وغير شرعي 
إضافة القرارات موجودة بديش أنا أضيع الوقت تبع الأسئلة الأخرى لكن فيما يتعلق بتحديد العلاقات مع إسرائيل تحديد العلاقات مع إسرائيل البيان الختامي للمجلس الوطني قال أن تنكر إسرائيل الاتفاقات الموقعة جعل من المرحلة الانتقالية منتهية كيف نترجم ذلك أنا بتحدث الآن كأمين سر لجنة تنفيذية لمنظمة التحرير أنا مسؤوليتي 15 مليون فلسطيني فيش فرق بين واحد والتاني حكيت أول شيء لما نفذتش وقفة التنسيق الأمني وما وقفتش الـ الـ ما, ما خدش قرار سحب الاعتراف بإسرائيل بعدين قلت لي الناس زهقت والناس تعبانة وفيش رواتب وفيش أشياء زي هيك أنا كل كلمة بتحكيها بدأ أفكر فيها مئة مرة قبل ما اتخذ قرار أنا بدي أشوف بتأثر عليك يا أخ سائد بتأثر على عيلتك بتأثر على ابنك أنا بعنيني صمودك وبقائك على أرضك هذا اللي بعنيني فإذا ما 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 ما, ما عنديش عصا سحرية كمان أنا أسوي هيك الأخي كل شيء محلول ليه 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 لا الراتب 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 عن غزة إن شاء الله في طريقه للحل الراتب عن غزة في طريقه للحل ما فيش فرق بين الضفة وبين غزة وإن شاء الله بطريقة قلت لك في لجنة خصيصا شكلت بقرار المجلس الوطني من كل الفصائل وخلال أقل من 48 ساعة بكون وضعها على الطاولة لكن بدي أسأل الجميع في حالة كان كل ما تطلبه أنت محطوط في الورقة ورفضت حماس شو بدك تسوي؟ شو بدك تقول؟ بدك تمسك العصا من النص وتقول فتحوا حماس البريسيف؟ بدك تسمي الأشياء بأسمائها ولا لا؟ ما بدي أدرى بهم خلينا خلينا ما بديش ما بديش ادخل شوفي حماس حركه فلسطينيه سياسيه وليست حركه ارهابيه بنختلف معها بنتفق معها جزء من الشعب الفلسطيني ومكون لما بنختلف نرجعش لصناديق الرصاص نرجع لصناديق الاقتراع هذا الموقف هذا الموقف الفلسطيني وفلسطين هيك وطول عمرها فلسطين هيك وراح تكون هيك ولا يمكن تكون فلسطين الا هيك انا ما بقولش ان شعبنا بيش اخطاء بقولش انه فيش عندنا ناس بيرتكبوا اخطاء قاتله لكن على الاقل فيش شيء خطا بيرتكب وبيتخبى عنا ولا مواطن فلسطيني مطلوب يشوف في عينين ابو مازن ولا يسمع في ذهن ابو مازن ولا يحكي بلسان ابو مازن ولا معلوماتك ما حدا فينا فاز في انتخابات اكثر انتخابات فزت فيها انا مجلس تشريع 52% كانت وكثير وكثير يعني كثير علي 52 يأيدوني و48 يعارضوني وبكفي هيك اما تقول لي والله فتح ريبريسيف ضغط وقهر الناس بايش؟ بايش؟ نزلوا الناس على الشوارع الجمعه اللي فاتت فتح اجتمعت وقررت انه في مؤامره على مشروعنا الوطني هيك قرروا وبدنا نتصدى لكل واحد بده يهاجم القياده حاليا ونحن داخلين في معركه مع امريكا اجتمعنا كل الجمركازية قلنا لا فيش مواجهه داخليه وأنا مرتاح جدا ليش؟ لسبب بسيط جدا 99 و99% من الشعب الفلسطيني متعلم ما حدا بيقدر يضحك عليه صح؟ أنا أنا بقول لك أنا بقول لك إنه الوعي الفلسطيني الوعي الفلسطيني وصل لمرحلة أه تعرف هذيك اليوم كنت مع مجموعة طلاب وأحد الطلاب وقف بقول لي أنت سويت عملية زراعة رئة بقول له اه قال بالنسبه لك عملية زراعة لسان <تصفيق> عشان تبطل تقول دولتين وتبطل تقول كذا وكذا 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 حق الناس يا جماعة بس بلاش احنا نمسك حالنا ونجلد نجلد الامور هلا بالنسبة للانقسام ال- ال- الانقسام نتج بقرار واعي استراتيجي لحركة حماس لجزء من مقاومة المسلمين هي الحكومة رئيس وزراء فلسطين هنية ووزير داخليتها يعني مش انت فاز في الانتخابات احنا قلنا مش نسلمكم فازت في الانتخابات مسك التليفون ابو مازن الو اخنيه انا بعطيك تكليف تشكيل الحكومه وحكومه وحده لكن ما صارش في التاريخ يعني الدول عبر التاريخ كلها تاتي الحكومات اما انتخابا اما انقلابا اما تبديلا اما ثوره اما تعديلا بدك اياه لاول مره يعني لما اجى الامام الخميني على الحكم في ايران 
غير اسم دولته غير نسيج الاجتماعي والسياسي والاقتصادي والديني لكن بيانه الأول قال إن جمهورية إيران الإسلامية تعترف بما وتقر وتلتزم بما عليها في المجال التعاقدي الأمني والمالي والسياسي والاقتصادي نيلسون مانديلا بعد ديكليرك ما التزم بكل شيء إحنا عنا أنا بتذكر لما السيد هنيه أجب حكومته على المجلس التشريعي وقدمها كنت أنا رديت عليه باسم المعارضة الملتزمة باسم المعارضة الملتزمة كنت فزت في المقعد فتح في محافظة ريحة والأغوار قلت له أخ هنية أنت اليوم لست رئيس وزراء لحماس أنت رئيس وزراء لي ولعموم الشعب الفلسطيني تصرف على هذا النحو علينا التزامات وعلينا استحقاقات نقدرش نلغيها وشو بقول لي في الجواب بما أننا فزنا في الانتخابات يجب إلغاء الاتفاقات بما أننا فزنا في الانتخابات يجب إلغاء ميثاق الجامعة العربية والأمم المتحدة ومبادرة السلام العربية فقل هيك حكى في الإعلام في التلفزيون بس مباشر فأنا قلت له يومتها اليوم أقول الديمقراطية نجحت وحماس فشلت بصرش يا رجل إحنا فلاحين لما بموت أبو للواحد بودي واقف على القبر أقسم بالله وأقول من كان له في ذمة هذا الرجل شيء فهو عندي ما أنا ابنه منين جيتني أنت تقول لي بما أني فزت الانتخابات بدي ألغي الاتفاقات وألغي الالتزامات وألغي الديون اللي علي وألغي وألغي وألغي, وألغي. ومرة حلال ومرة حرام تدخلني في في السياسة اللي نهار ما بدي ما بدي أنا أعمق الأمور شوف شوف سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ضرب في الطائف والتفت للسماء وقال والله ما اغفر لقومي فهم لا يعلمون وجاوب ربنا سبحانه وتعالى وإنك على خلق عظيم هذا الرجل دعا مرة واحدة بحياته قال هلك المتنطعون هلك المتنطعون هلك المتنطعون من المتنطع يا رسول الله أجاب الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم المغالي من ذهب إلى المسجد لاستخدام الله وليس العبادة الله إيش ربي لك لحي وألبس لك أفغانستان وأقول لك جزاك الله خيرا الله يرضى عليك وصرت أنا أقرب يعني خلص يعني جماعة هو الواحد بده يد... هذه فلسطين هذا وفاء لا شهداء ولا جرحى وأسرة وما فيش قائد قيادة بتعني المسؤولية بتعني اتخاذ القرارات الصحيحة شوف بإمكاني كأي سياسي فلسطيني في موقف صحيح في موقف مريح بس تطيع آجي هون ونأخذ الموقف المريح شو الجمهور بحب يسمع لا تعدد السلطات في المجتمعات السياسية كتعدد الأزواج للزوجة تصور تخيل وبالتالي لا احنا الائتلافات الائتلافات شيء مش ضد الائتلاف بعد الانتخابات مش ضد الائتلاف بعد سوينا حكومه ائتلافيه مع حماس سوينا واليوم حماس تقول لك انت خذ الحكومه بس خلي لي الحكم خذ الحكومه ادفع التكاليف سوي اللي بدك اياه وخلي لي الحكم فلسطين اكبر والقدس وأهم من كل عواصم العرب والمسلمين وفلسطين أهم من كل فصائل العمل السياسي الفلسطيني وفصائل العمل السياسي الفلسطيني ما فيها الحركة اللي أنا عضو لجنة مركزية فتح لم تولد حركتنا ولا أي حركة أخرى إلا اللي عادت فلسطين على الخارطة وفلسطين لن تكون قربان يقدم على معابد اللؤم والتمحور السياسي في هذه المنطقة أكبر بكثير والدول عبيد لمصالحها زيك زي لكن لما تيجي لفلسطين ما في إشي أهم من فلسطين والقدس إحنا بالنسبة للمسائل المتعلقة في أنوروا أنوروا أسست بقرار من الجمعية العامة سنة 1950 بتفويض محدد بتظلها تساعد اللاجئين إلى حين حل القضية الفلسطينية قضية اللاجئين من كل جوانبها أيوة أنوروا مش مؤسسة فلسطينية الدول تتبرع فرنسا بتعطي الانوروا مش 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 منحه استحقاق التزام عليها التزام على الدول المانحه كل دوله بتقدم لها امريكا قررت لانه نتنياهو قبل سنه ونص قال يجب الغاء انوروا لانها العقبه امام قضيه اللاجئين اسقاط انوروا من الوجود اسقاط ملف اللاجئين فهمت علي احنا بنقول لكم صراحه والله انا شخصيا زي ما حكيت قبل شويه حكي قلت لكم يعني حاولنا مفاوضات 20 سنه لكن انا بدي اوصيكم إلكم 37 كيلو متر على البحر الميت إلكم القدس الشرقية بالأقصى والقيام العاصمة إلكم إلكم ممر آمن تحت السيادة الفلسطينية بين غزة والضفة إلكم حقوق مائية مش حصص إلكم حق العودة للاجئين سنة 94 
إياكم أن تقايضوا حق بحق وإياكم أن تسمحوا لعامل الوقت أو من الجرائم من المستوطنات والإملاءات والاعتقالات والاغتيالات والحصار والإغلاق وهدم البيوت وتهجير السكان وسجن الأطفال والإعدامات الميدانية سيوف مسلطة على رقابنا إحنا بنقبض على الجمر ونحن نتفاوض مع إسرائيل على الجمر قابضين لكن لن نسمح وفاء للشهداء وللأسرة والجرحى إن أن نلطخ تاريخنا إنه قبلنا نقايض حق بحق هذه حقوق قرر لها القانون الدولي والزمن معنا تاريخ معنا شوي بس لو سمحت لو سمحت هو هو اجل فلسطين لل 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 للاردن قال لهم مثلا ما في اسئله لا رفضت الاردن رفضت كليا ما هو في اسئله هلا ما في هو أسئلة. قال انه اذا الوكاله تصرف 200 مليون دولار في الاردن انا بدل ما اعطيها للوكاله بعطيها للحكومه مقابل انها الحكومه تقبل 200 مليون دولار والسنه الجايه ما ندفع لهم مش تروح الوكاله بالضبط فالاردن قال لهم لا وكاله الغوث هي المسؤوله عن اللاجئين مش انا وكذلك فعل لبنان وفعلت سوريا وفعلت كل الدول العربية وإحنا كمان دولة مضيفة تمام شكرا السلام دكتور لا في في بلاش بقول لي ما جوابت إن شاء الله يخليك تمام بس شوي شوي يا عم ما هو أنتوا جيتوا في الوقت غير مناسب مية مية في مباراة كأس عالم بس في مباريات كأس عالم وفي شغلات زي هيك وجيتوا تسووا لي مؤتمرات في الوقت هذا وبعدين كنت تشكو طولنا ما طولنا خلاص جينا جينا خلاص بالعكس كمل دكتور بس شوي شوي على المترجمين خصوصا الايات والاحاديث طيب دير بالك انا من الراسخين في العلم يعني اذا بدك تخش في السلام السلام مصطلح عظيم واهم نقطه ارتكاز لبني ادم السلام حاجه بيس از ا نيد انا قلت كلمه ما ان ابني ضميري وعذبني على عذابات اليهود والاسرائيليين جلست معهم هذه حقيقه انا جلست معهم ادراكا مني انه في لي حاجه ومصلحه ونفس الشيء هو ما صحيش من ضميره ان ابو عذاباتي انه جلس معي السلام له حاجه اذا مش اكثر مني زيي اذا مش اكثر مني زيي لكن السلام مش مباراه كره قدم واحد يفوز واحد يخسر واحد يملي على الثاني سلام قدرة الطرفين المتخاصمين على الاحتكام للمصالح بإيجاد أرضية مشتركة تأخذ بعين الاعتبار مصالح كل طرف واستراتيجيا شو بدون تجعنا في المستقبل فبالتالي قواعد السلام محددة وواضحة وما فيش يعني بقول لك إنه بغيروش الفلسطينيين زي ما قال جاسين قريب بلاد في مقاله من عشرين سنة شو أغير له بدو يعني اعترف له في القدس عاصمه لاسرائيل بدو يعني اسقط ملف اللاجئين واقبل بوجود الاسرائيلي في دوله فلسطين والايد الامنيه العليا لاسرائيل بديش لا. انا انا بمشي الباتنا تبعتي على كلمه واحده الباتنا اللي هي ذا بيست اولتيرناتيف تو نيجوشيت ذا اجريمنت دامج كنترول بدي احد من الضرر الفتره الحاليه مش شايف كان لي حق مكاسب او حتى اني اطور مكاسب فانا بوظف اليات الحد من الضرر دامج كنترول ميكانيزمز والله بدون ما يسمح الحاكم العسكري تبع ريحه اني اطلع من الريحه ما بطلع واذا بسمحش للرئيس محمود عباس ينزل من من رام الله على عمان ما بطلع ومش مدعين احنا انه مجتمع وصلنا لمرحله الاستقلال السياسي الناجز تحت احتلال لكن لن نكون طرف في املاءات لن نكون طرف في اي املاءات امريكيه واسرائيليه مهما بلغت الحديث عن استبدال القياده وانا بتذكر في يوم من الايام كان الرئيس ياسر عرفات محاصر الله يرحمه وكانت الدنيا قائمه قاعده الفساد والمؤسسات ودنيا ودينه كانوا زملاء الي يروحوا يسالوه والله في يوم من الايام بقول لهم يعني هيك يعني معروف يعني بنهجي في الاصلاح وفي مساءلة وفي المحاسبة وفي الديمقراطية فبقول لهم بدس كلمة واحدة بدي أحكي لكم إياها لو جاءت الأم تريزا رئيسة للشعب الفلسطيني ومونتيسكيو رئيس للبرلمان الفلسطيني وتوماس جيفرسون رئيس وزراء لفلسطين وقالوا دولة فلسطينية حدود 67 القدس الشرقية عاصمة لها وحق العودة على أساس 94 بدون يكونوا إرهابيين وأولاد عرس ويجب التخلص منهم واستبدالهم بقيادة جديدة وهي اللي بتسوي امريكا اليوم. امريكا اليوم لما بتقول ان الشعب الفلسطيني يستحق ما هو افضل من صائب عرقات 
مش لانه والله انا يعني انسان او او قياده ليش الغلط تبعي اني بكرر هالقدس شرقيه عاصمه لفلسطين وهذا يجب ان يلغي يعني نريد هذا الفلسطيني الذي يقلب الموازين ونتنياهو اخترع كلمه جديده هذيك اليوم اللي هي قضيه السلام يقوم على الحقيقه بي بيس ويل بي بيزد اون ذا تروث يعني المستوطنات والاملاءات والاغتيالات والاعتقالات وفرض الحقائق على الارض هي تروث اللي لازم نقبلها لا مش حنقبلها مش حنقبلها ولن نكون طرف فيها ولن نشرحها لن نشرحها وزي ما قلنا الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية أنت قوة عظمى عضو مجلس أمن عندك إمكانيات هائلة جدا العجز التجاري بينك وبين الصين 364 مليار دولار لصالح الصين العجز التجاري مع ألمانيا 37 مليار دولار لصالح ألمانيا العجز التجاري كذا وكذا أنا كل اللي صدرته لأسواق أمريكا سنة 2017 كفلسطيني 5 مليون دولار بلح ورخام والله ببيحهم في سوق ريحة أصغر سوق في رمضان الجاي فبالتالي المسائل واضحة ومحددة ولا بنبالغ ولا بنزايد ولا بنهدد الولايات المتحدة هي المشكلة ولن تستطيع أن تكون جزء من الحل تحت مواقف هذه الإدارة هلأ بدهم يسووا سلام مع زنوبيا يسووا سلام مع بنت يسووا سلام حرار أنا حمش أنا بس أنا كمخلوق فلسطيني هؤلاء ليسوا شركاء نقطة وأول سطر استبدلوا السيناريوهات لا الثقة مش مفقودة مع الشعب الفلسطيني مش مفقودة على الإطلاق مع الشعب الفلسطيني والله أنا كثير مرات بكون قاعد في الندوات جلسات في الجامعات بروح كثير وبلف وبطلع وأنا زي ما قلت لكم يعني إيد ورا وإيد قدام ما بدي أعيش إنه عندي جيش وعندي محاور وعندي أنا مجرد جندي صغير لفلسطين ما مش شايف يعني هالدرجة إنه ما فيش ثقة مع الشعب الفلسطيني بوقف لي واحد بقول لي الشارع الفلسطيني، طب هو انا منين جاي؟ انا جاي من السماء الفلسطينية؟ طب انا من الشارع. بعدين مين اعطاك الحق تحكي باسم الشارع؟ انت ما تعطينيش انا حكي باسم الشارع. وينها؟ طيب كويس. كويس. 70% من سيدي العزيز الرئيس من خمس سنين قال انا لن اخوض انتخابات، بدنا نسوي انتخابات. فهمت علي؟ بعدين احنا فلسطينيين متمسكين في الرئيس. وبنقول لك لا لا بدنا نسوي بدنا نسوي انتخابات بدنا نسوي انتخابات يعني رئيس عباس عليك بدبابه مش انتخب 62% من الاصوات 2005 شو بنص القانون؟ شو بنص القانون؟ القانون الاساسي ما احنا هي المشكله تبعتنا وين المصلين؟ شاطرين يا رجل لا يخلى لا لا يخلى المجلس التشريعي المجلس التشريعي يبقى عضو مجلس تشريعي لحين قسم اعضاء المجلس الجديد للقسم اليمين طيب شو نسوي مين؟ احنا بدناش انتخابات؟ الناس احنا بدناش انتخابات؟ يا رجل سوينا مجلس مركزي ومجلس وطني ومجلس ولجنة تنفيذية مركزية طيب سيدي طيب طيب يا سيدي العزيز طيب طيب يا سيدي العزيز مش انا مش انا اللي سويت الانقلاب يقلعوا لنا حركة حماس بشغلة واحدة أن نتفق على موعد انتخابات عامة تحت الإشراف الدولي المناسب والذي يتناسب مع حماس خلاص يا ريت والله أنا مستعد أنا مستعد أنا والله مستعد والله ما صدق صدقني ما عندي مشكلة على الإطلاق مش في اليوم بكرة أو بعده بالنسبة لحل السلطة بالنسبة لحل بالنسبة لحل السلطة لو سمحتوا السلطة النقطة الأخيرة النقطة الأخيرة سمحت دكتور لو سمحت الحوار دائما احنا في يعني بدناش نحكي في انتم سالتوا اسمعوا الجواب ما بصير يعني هيك مقاطعه مش طريقه ديالوج هذا مونولوج بليز ليسن تفضل دكتور في عادات صعب تغييرها يا اخي الشعب الفلسطيني بحب المونولوج خليهم يحكوا انا عارف شو مؤثر عليك انت انتقادات ضدي انا خليهم يحكوا انا مبسوط حل السلطه السلطه ثمره كفاح الشعب الفلسطيني السلطه الفلسطينيه ولدت لنقل الشعب الفلسطيني من احتلال الاستقلال إسرائيل من 2009 لليوم فرغت السلطة من مضمونها وجعلتها سلطة بدون سلطة 2009 2009 لما لما رجع الإدارة المدنية لما يسمى هدى والسمرة للحياة نتنياهو السلطة الآن أصبحت سلطة بدون سلطة لأنك زي ما تحط استراتيجية أنت 
نتنياهو بحط استراتيجيه استراتيجيه نتنياهو قائمه ثلاث ركائز سلطه بدون سلطه احتلال بدون كلفه وفصل غزه عن الفضاء الفلسطيني هي س... هي استراتيجيته انا اللي بقول لك اياه وجود كاتب الحكي من خمس سنين في دراسات بوزعها على المجلس الثوري اللجنه الوط... اللجنه المركزيه اللجنه التنفيذيه المجالس الوطنيه انه السلطه تدمر ولما قلت لك قيادات بده يدمر السلطه في الضفه اي نعم وهو بدمر فيها بالفعل عم بدمر فيها القياده البديله للسلطه ولابو مازن انا حكيتها مره والناس فهموني غلط قلت الرئيس الفعلي للشعب الفلسطيني ليبرمان ورئيس الوزراء تبع الاداره المدنيه لا هلا اسمه كميل آه. آه. كان اسمه بولي اول شيء آه. بطل بولي فبالتالي الوضع الحالي غير قابل للبقاء والصمود وحكومة إسرائيل تعمل جادة على انهيار السلطة آه لا الحل هيك الحل أنه التركيز على غزة والعنوان اللي بيحكي فيه كوشنيري اليوم بليونز لغزة مشاريع موانئ كذا نقتطع من مهم من الضريبة لغزة لكلمة دولة غزة على اساس يقتل المشروع الوطني الفلسطيني بدولة فلسطين بعاصمتها القدس، وهذا وهم هذا إلى فشل فهمت علي؟ لكن شو ما كان الوضع الشعب الفلسطيني باقي وموجود ولا شيء بيخلي في أمن واستقرار وسلام في المنطقة إلا تجفيف مستنقع الاحتلال الإسرائيلي وإقامة دولة فلسطين المستقلة بعاصمتها القدس الشرقية وحل قضايا الوضع النهائي لأنها حاجة حاجة دولية وحاجة إسرائيلية وخذ مني اسمع مني اصبر اثبت ابقى على ارضك انا كان اولادي هون قبل شويه كان عندي وصيه واحدة لهم اشتغلوا في فلسطين وتجوزوا في فلسطين ما تطلعوش برا بس هذا هذا هو العنصر الاساسي للشعب العظيم هذا الوفاء للشهداء والاسرى والجرحى دولتك حتميه تاريخيه سياسيه اقتصاديه اخلاقيه قانونيه دينيه الدوله الفلسطينيه قادمه لا محاله ولم نكن اقرب للدوله الفلسطينيه واستقلالها بعاصمه القدس ما نحن عليه الان. دول عبيد لمصالحها. وظف ادواتك حتى انك تستطيع اقناع الدول انه هذه مصلحتها وشكرا جزيلا. شكرا دكتور يعطيك العافيه. بكي عندنا مستر بات وكارول يجاوبوا على الاسئله اللي انسالت مستر بات. I'll try to be brief. Um, just our friend in, in the red hat, I'm not entirely sure what point he was making about the British uh, people and the Irish people and what difference there was between them, but the simple and the clear difference. The British were the colonizers and the Irish were the colonized, and that's all the difference that anyone need understand uh, in the conflict in, in Ireland. Um, it's not the first time I've come across uh, comrades who don't understand uh, or don't have a full understanding of the conflict in Ireland. Uh, if Ireland was lifted and placed in the middle of Africa, there would be no difficulty understanding it because it would be viewed through the prism of colonialism. And that's the only way to understand the, the conflict uh, in Ireland. It wasn't a religious conflict, although religion uh, was a factor in it as well. But, but the issue was about uh, colonization. Uh, in terms of the question, uh, my friend there asked about whether the IRA was viewed as an oppressive force. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's probably, there was probably a very complex relationship between the community, uh, not so much within the community within which the IRA operated, because it had you know, uh, a significant support within that community. But I have no doubt there were, there were others who did view the IRA as an oppressive force. But by and large, uh, that view would have come from people who were politically opposed to the IRA anyway. And uh, on top of everything else, much of the information that was provided to the people in Ireland uh, came through a filter of censorship. So people didn't often get the full facts 
uh, about what was happening, why events took place. But of course, the, the IRA itself engaged in actions that were absolutely and totally wrong, that should never have happened. And, you know, it's, it's one of the arguments I make about armed struggle, that people who elevate armed struggle into a principle rather than, a, than what it is, just a tactic to try and advance uh, your struggle. Armed struggle can on occasion be a hindrance to advancing struggle. Uh, and, and, and that happened to us on occasions in Ireland and it has happened here in Palestine as well. And that's why it's important. I mean, no, nobody would deny the right of a people under occupation uh, to use armed force. The question is, is it the right tactic to use? Uh, and on occasion, it's definitely not the right tactic to use. But uh, it, it's a fairly complex relationship. And I mentioned earlier the election of Bobby Sands, who was clearly a volunteer in the Irish Republican Army. Yet the people came out and supported him in, in that election. And there were obviously a significant number of people who voted for Bobby Sands who did not support the IRA uh, armed struggle. So it's a fairly complex relationship. And if we jump forward to the present day, Sinn Féin, uh, in terms of the popular vote, is the largest political party on the island of Ireland. We're, we're the only party who organizes on both sides of the border, in the north and in the south. Uh, but we are the largest party going by the, if, if you count the popular vote. So uh, obviously when people go into the ballot box, they, they, they certainly now anyway, they don't see us as an oppressive force. Well, uh, uh, absolutely, there was, you know, the, the, uh, there, there were a number of, of parties involved in the negotiations ar around the time of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. We were not the main party on the nationalist Republican side at that time. However, we have since become the largest party. Uh, and, and, and we would say that the, the, the largest party at the time um, were responsible for parts of the Good Friday Agreement that we think had we been the largest party would have produced a better result uh, on our terms anyway. Um, but, I mean, at, at the time of the negotiations, and, and, and it would be wrong to say there was widespread division, because there was a certain unity of purpose between the nationalist parties in the north, including ourselves, as well as the Irish government, who were, you know, on the face of it, political opponents of ours as well. Uh, but there was a common purpose around creating an agreement that uh, had at its very core the concept of equality. Uh, because we believe that you know, the, the reason and the rationale, you know, for colonialism in the first place is that one group within society has a privileged position over and above everyone else in society. However, if you have a society which is based on equality, that privilege will eventually be eroded. And the rationale for, you know, in our case, uh, the link with the United Kingdom is eroded. Uh, and, and, and that's where we see that whole negotiation going. Uh, at, at, at the core of our strategy at the minute is the implementation of equality and of rights. Uh, and uh, that undermines the whole notion of privileged or a privileged position for one group in society. Okay, thank you, Mr. Baird. Thank you very much. So now, Carol, please answer the question, and then we'll close the session. Thank yes. Uh, you asked about uh, why we can do the same as in the first intifada, right? Or something like that? 
Mm. Well, Gaza is one place. The West Bank is divided into very small places. So the first answer would be the first answer would be the division among areas A, B, and C. That's why itself fragmented the Palestinians after Oslo. So it fragmented them not just physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, uh, on all level. So there's no social solidarity whatsoever, at least according to research. Uh, the lack of trust is huge among even people in the same city, a refugee camp, and so on and so forth. There is another thing that is different from the first intifada is the lack of leadership. The lack of leadership on coordinated resistance. I'm talking about uh, the big names from the first intifada. They don't exist anymore. Mubarak Awad, for example, was expelled. Uh, some other people were, were, were finished, they were killed, or they were imprisoned forever, or they were uh, deported. So, you know, the big leadership has left, or they become heads of NGOs, or they become part of a political party. That's, that's what happened to uh, the leadership. The third and most important one, which we are not, um, you know, noticing, they talked here about people being imprisoned by, lo imprisoned by loans and so on and so forth, but they don't notice that there is an internationalization of NGOs. There is an internationalization of activism. Anyone from outside can come and tell you, can you do a march here around the wall so that we can take a picture and say, you know, it was funded by I don't know who. That's what's happening to activism. It's not anymore a self-help it's not anymore a volunteer. It's about, you know, um, uh, uh, fighting for funding, for resources. And I could only name a few of the people who are not working that way. And there are. And that's why I keep saying, don't look for the organized. Look for the non-organized, because this is what is happening. The non-organized, no one is funding it. We are doing it by default. We are living the everyday resistance because we have to survive, but not just survive, as Muhammad al said, we are resisting actively. You know, we are doing stuff. We are not just sitting and waiting for something to change. So that's why I'm claiming that the individual scattered uh, resistance is actually the name of the game, but it needs to be empowered and supported and not crushed. And so, um, right. Well, it's not going to be costly on the big level, like the political level or what is happening, for example. I wish there is a Gaza example all over the West Bank. That would be amazing if there is a coordinated body who could do something like that. And that's what I've been calling here in, in my suggestion here is to have one body who could empower all these scattered groups. If the PA could support that, that will be the best uh, uh, solution. I, I cannot answer that. I cannot answer. I cannot answer that. I cannot answer that. I, I'm always optimistic. I'm always optimistic when you share when you share a goal and a vision, even when you have uh, difficult, uh, mis you know, you, you have differences in opinions, and I have huge differences about. I've, I've always been opposing also since day one. So, but I still believe in everybody's role in this. I believe in the PA role, and I believe in Hamas's role. I believe in Palestinians inside's role. I believe in the scholars and the practitioners. We all complete each other. And, uh, you know, what Israel has created among us is divide and rule. And not just, uh, not just areas A, B, and C in Jerusalem, Israel and Palestine, Palestinians inside Israel and Gaza. So it's also divided and ruled mentally. You know, we think we know better. Thank you, Carol. So, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Well, I'd like really to close this session. I think I want to thank you all really for the lively discussion and for waiting one hour more almost, which means that this session is very lively and interesting to all of you, and we have to close it by force. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. Thanks everyone for being here today and being so patient. We hope to see you tomorrow morning. Our first session will start at 10 a.m. Please have a great evening. <laughs>